Hi. 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 <laughs> and she's quite advised by myself and Mike. So this has been a really, tr a real treat for us to work with Lauren because it's both outside our area, but it's going to allow us to collaborate and sort of taking us off the troll, which has been great for us to learn a lot. I think it's very, very, very productive. This is a fish and wildlife service. Um, and trying to understand better about the Kilago wood rat habitat use. So Lauren, take it away. All right. Sorry if I did the lights. Looks good. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the great turnout today. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about my thesis research on the habitat use of the Key Largo wood rat. Right. So the core of my project has to do with habitat and habitat selection. Um, and habitat selection is essentially the process in which an animal chooses which habitat components within an environment to use. And the idea is that any given environment is a suite of available resources. It could be things like access to fresh water, understory cover, um, type of geological substrate, or the absence or presence of certain species. And the idea behind it is that any given organism has to figure out Okay, which of these resources will protect me? Which will give me food? And then choose areas within that environment that has the highest concentrations of those necessary resources. So, habitat is also an important part of ecology. Um, it's very important for ecology at all levels. At the organism level, it can influence life history and behavior, and that feeds into population structure, speciation rates, interspecies interactions, and ultimately the functioning of entire ecosystems. Um, so <coughs> shelters add another level to habitat. They're a way that animals can further improve their habitat and try to make a go of it. And shelters have certain costs attached to them. It takes time and effort to create them and maintain them. But if, but it, it's a, a benefit to many species. It increases their reproductive output and their survival. And some of the shelter benefits include uh, protection from adverse environmental conditions like extreme heat or cold, um, the ability to defend them against predators, a place to store their food, and a place to safely raise their young. Uh, and habitat is also an important part of conservation. Many of the now extinct species and by habitat loss. But if we know more about their habitat preferences, it can also help us with protecting those species and facilitating the recovery. For example, the red cockaded woodpecker lives in longleaf pine forests, but it doesn't live everywhere in the pine forest. If we know the areas that they are, located and what kind of habitat components are associated with those areas, then we can find out things like, oh, they like areas that have mature pine trees for their nest sites, or areas that are more recently burned. So if you know that, then we can try to replicate those conditions in other areas and try to facilitate their expansion. So my study species is the Kilargo wood rat. It's a subspecies of eastern wood rats, and as the name suggests, it's only found on Key Largo. It's found in the tropical hardwood hammocks, the, the uplands of the island. And there are a lot of things. They're herbivores, they're nocturnal, they're solitary, territorial, and also they're an endangered subspecies, mostly because of limited habitat. And Probably the most known thing about wood rats is that they produce these large stick nests. They're found, wood rats are found all across North America, and these stick nests can be, kind of think of a refrigerator that's been turned over on its sides. It can be that big. 
and they can serve as shelter from environmental conditions, protection from predators, a place to cast their food, and as a place to raise their young. And on Key Largo, there are main, two main types of nests that I've classified, what I term as natural nests and artificial nests. Now, natural nests have materials that are things that you would find before human settlement. So things like solution holes, overturned trees, uh, that would be the core substrate of the nest. And then they would modify it with piling sticks. Um, also, <coughs> there's what I term artificial nests, which are made out of man-made materials. Uh, things that people have left behind, like old cars, washing machines, tire piles, all sorts of things. But the main point is that they're materials that wouldn't normally have been there without humans. Uh, and there's also a third type of nest, which I call supplemental. Uh, there's also been like starter nests, um, that, that's another term. But uh, they're also made out of man-made materials. Um, but they're different from artificial nests in that they're specifically placed for wood rats to use. And I don't really talk about it very much in, in my study, but uh, they're pretty important too. So just to get an idea of how wood rats use their landscape, um, wood rats will build or maintain about four to five different nests within their territory. And their territory has been averaged to be about 3,000 square meters and with, uh, with approximate radius of about 30 meters. And like I said, they can be natural or artificial on Key Largo. And as a cross section, you can see that um, they can have multiple entrances, they can have different chambers within the nest. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of how wood rats nests look like in the landscape. So why should we care about wood rats at all? They're rodents. Generally, we think of rodents as being pests, like the, the common rats you might find in a house or something. But wood rats are actually amazingly important for their environments. Um, in desert environments, they're known as ecological engineers, in which they can change the soil and vegetation structure around their nests in a way that improves arthropod diversity. They can be keystone herbivores on isolated islands. Uh, the Danzenti Island wood rat, which is a subspecies that lives off the coast of California, um, they are known to control which tree species are, are available and where they are on the island. They're known to be the prey of endangered species like northern spotted owl. And relating it kind of back to humans, uh, they're a good way of finding out what's happened in the past. In desert environments, the fossilized middens of past wood rats are good records for looking at paleoclimate and past vegetation patterns. So in terms of preferences made by wood rats, uh, there are a couple of things that people have found out over time. Um, they found that in many cases, wood rats will use um, a core nest substrate that is able to protect them from predators. So in the desert, they will often prefer to use these cactuses, these cacti, as the core substrate. Because imagine as a predator trying to get through that to get to the wood rat. It's, it's going to be a difficult task. And for the Allegheny wood rats in the Appalachians, a similar idea is thought of for as to the reason they're limited to rocky crevices. So if you're a larger, bigger boned predator, it might be harder to get to them from there. Um, also, they've also been uh, they've been known to be associated with particular types of vegetation. Um, in California, they've been shown to be associated with poison oak a lot, a lot of times, um, which might might be because it might deter predators, or it could just maintain a long-standing understory cover to mask their movements on the ground. There was an experiment in 1973 in which Olson um, found out that wood rats use and prefer areas that have higher overstory and understory cover. And they're also known to choose um, 
different types of forest types over others. Um, in the Appalachians, they prefer oak woodlands compared to pine forests, perhaps because oak woodlands have more acorns, and that's a pretty good food source for them. So on Key Largo in particular, there's been some work on habitat prevalence. But most of it's been focused on forest age. And it's been kind of all over the map. There's been a lack of consensus. Um, with earlier authors um, remarking that they seem to be associated with older or mature forests. Um, and more recent authors believing maybe it's more related to uh, medium or younger age forests. And there's also been people who say perhaps forest age is not the main predictor of where wood rats can be found, and that perhaps it's more related to what kind of nest substrate is available for them to use. Um, so where my work differs from past work is mostly in methods. Um, most of the prior studies have looked at live trapping, which is very good for a lot of things, but it does have its drawbacks, especially for an animal that will usually have a set territory. The problem with live trapping is that you're baiting traps. So you're potentially drawing an animal into an area that it wouldn't normally be using because there's bait, there's ready food available to eat. So that's a potential problem there. But for my study, I use a, a different technique, which uh, has been used for other wood rats, but very sparingly. At looking at the nest distribution itself. Because the nests don't move anywhere and they're a pretty good indicator of if, if they built a nest, then they're using the area. So my primary research questions are centered on those two things. Um, with nest distribution, is nest distribution associated with any particular habitat variables? And nest occupancy, the same question. So I, I test a lot of habitat variables, but these three are the main ones that I was looking at. And from a literature review and seeing that some of the more recent authors have been pointing to uh, preferences related to human disturbance, uh, younger forests, which indicate um, areas that have been more recently disturbed by people, and artificial substrate is being preferred. So that was my main hypothesis, was that they would prefer areas like old roads, artificial nest substrates, and younger hammocks. So for my study system, hopefully most of you are familiar with this site, but uh, it's basically southern Florida, the very tip. And these are the Everglades here, of course. And that kind of scab-like thing is Miami. And if you go further down in the red box, that's the beginning of the Florida Keys with Key Largo. And on Key Largo in particular, my work was focused on the northern end, because that's the remaining range of Key Largo wood rat. And they're limited to these two protected areas that are split down the middle by this county, county road 905 that runs up the middle with on the east side being Dagny Johnson State Park, and on the west side being Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And this isn't a completely pristine area. It's very interesting because it's often, it's pockmarked with old roads running through it, uh, remnants from when this area was about to be developed for residential areas. Um, there's an old army base up there. It's just it's not quite pristine. You have to think of it as kind of a, a mosaic of different habitats. So for determining nest distribution, I used variable width line transfer, transect surveys all up and down this area. And I broke it down into two categories of transects. Um, with the old roads that are marked in red here, those old roads are the same ones that I was talking about, the, the abandoned roads from previous attempts to develop the area. And so I did 45 of those. And these forest transects, which I did about 40 of those and stratified them across the three different hammock age types. 
And for those, I, I randomly chose them using a random point generator in ArcMap um, and incited them along this road. So I would then walk out, see, walk out pretty much in perpendicular to the road and just keep going until you hit mangrove. But as you can see here, these are the, the hammock ages that you can find all across Key Largo, with the lighter areas being the most recently disturbed areas. And all of that was determined from aerial photos uh, processed by the Ross Lab, especially Josh Diamond. Um, and that's how I figured out hammock ages, and that's how I stratified my transects. So for the transects themselves, Take a closer look at some of these. Uh, the white lines are the transects, and these red and blue blips are the nests that I found. But the process of doing the transect is basically walking in a straight line, checking on either side, and looking basically at anything that could be a possible nest. And if it wasn't, you'd just return to the line and keep searching. But if you did find a nest, then I would conduct an adaptive survey where I would start at the center where the found nest was and then move out in sort of a spiral search pattern until I would reach either another nest or reach the 30 meter mark, which is that, that radius I was talking about earlier of the estimated wood rat territory. And to determine occupancy, I used Reconyx remote cameras and set them up outside of each of the nests that I found for about five to six days. And those cameras would be running day and night. Um, they'd be triggered by passive infrared signatures along with movement. So perfect for capturing small mammal movement. And then I would just go back, download those images, review all those images, and figure out if there was a wood rat in the frame or anything else. Um, and that's a wood rat inside of a abandoned car, by the way. So this is kind of what I found for that. Um, all these dots here reflect one of the 77 nests that I found, with the black dots being the ones where I found wood rats at the site using those cameras, and the white sites being the absent sites. But just from looking at it, there's there's some clustering, but there's no apparent relationships to be found just by looking at the map. So I collected a lot more data. I collected a lot of habitat variables at these nest sites um, in different categories. We had forest data, anthropogenic data, um, some variables on nest and animal presence from those cameras. And besides those 77 sites, I also surveyed the, uh, a bunch of random sites. They were random sites along the sample transects, but not associated with any nest. And those were stratified across old roads and forest transects, and also across those three hammock ages. And at those sites, I just collected the forest data and the anthropogenic data, because there was no nest there to collect nest data, and I didn't have cameras on there because there's no nest there. So for the forest data, I would start at the nest or the center point and survey within five meters of the nest. And collect things like canopy cover, soil depth, foliage density, tree richness, and tree diameters along with uh, the presence of certain food species. Uh, the food tree species were determined from past studies like the, the Hirsch thesis and from a microhistological study by um, Castleberry. And of course, the forest age variables in which the young forest was defined as being disturbed since 1959 or more recently than that medium age as being disturbed between 1940 and 1959, and old forest as being disturbed um, in 1940 or even earlier than that. Uh, so some of the anthropogenic variables I collected was whether or not it was along an old road or a forest transect, which is that first one, 
uh, proximity to old roads and road type, in which the road type is kind of a it's a measure of road disturbance, where the lower values are like forest transects, where there's no road disturbance at all, and higher values would be the paved old road, which um, theoretically should pose the most road disturbance. <coughs> and a couple things relating to management. Uh, that just meant wasn't on the state side or the federal side, and to supplemental nest proximity. And some nest variables relating to nest area, um, to nest substrate, which that type variable just meant was it artificial or natural. Nest material, which broke it down even more into was it a solution hole, was it a tree, was it a trash pile. Number of entrances here, and average entrance size. And finally for the animal presence variables, Besides the wood rats themselves, I kept track kept track of everything, but uh, I, I mainly focused on the mesoconsumer presence. So animals like raccoons and possums, which are larger than wood rats and they're omnivores, so they're potential competitors with wood rats. And I also kept track of the presence of cotton mice. Um, Keylarga cotton mice are also an endangered species. Um, but uh, wood rats in other parts of North America have been shown to be sharing the same nest site as cotton mice. So there's potentially some kind of relationship there. Um, so I also kept track of that. So to figure out which of these variables, if any, were associated with um, nest distribution or nest occupancy, I used model selection uh, based on information theory in which I formulated different models based on alternate hypotheses and then ran them through logistic regression and ranked each model by AICC values. And within those top ranking models, then I looked at standardized beta estimates to compare within those models which parameters were the driving parameters, which ones were most important. So for the logistic regression, I compared the nest sites to the random sites for distribution. And for the occupancy models, I compared unoccupied sites to occupied sites. And these are the candidate models I ran. Um, human disturbance, which included the transect, was an old road or a forest transect, uh, road proximity, and road type. Habitat complexity, which looked at canopy cover, uh, soil depth and foliage density, forest structure, which looked at tree richness, hammock age, canopy cover, and foliage density, food, which looked at food tree species presence, um, larger trees, which uh, the idea behind that was that larger trees might provide um, more fruit and more leaves for wood rats to use, and therefore be a factor with food, tree richness, and canopy cover. And some similar models relating just to is it an old road or a forest, um, wood road type, and soil or ground complexity. Um, forest age, because we've been talking about that for wood rats before, just to, to give it something to compare it to. Um, a management model with is it state or federal and supplemental nest proximity. And I ran all those models and a couple of interaction models where I combined, um, combined a couple models together to see what would happen. And for all these models, I got a global R-square of uh, 0.29, which indicates that for all variables that I tested, um, it explains 29% of the variation in that data, which provides adequate fit. That's at least explaining 30% of what's going on. Um, and the top model here was definitely this old road forest model, which uh, had a weight within those models of 69%. So by far outperforming the rest of the models. And the distant second, the runner up here, was the human disturbance model, which also included that transit parameter. 
So you can see, um, just looking at the parameters within those top two models, that the, the transect, which are bolded here, that these are definitely significant because p-values, very good p-values, and um, high beta values, which indicates not only is transect um, an important thing, but also that in particular old roads, are, that, that's the side of it that's important. And this makes sense because just looking at the raw data, we saw that um, by, by far that we but uh, by far we saw more old road nests than forest nests. So uh, for the, the occupancy models, we used the same models as the distribution models, but then we added a few more because it's looking at more data. So we have a nest type model, which is that artificial versus natural parameter, nest material, and nest construction, which is basically all those nest area variables and then soil, uh, mesoconsumer model, and cotton mouse model. And running all those, that's that's 23 models right there. So it's a good number of them. Any more and it might be a little bit excessive. But uh, we got a global R squared of 0.50, which is explaining 50% of the variation in data with these variables, which is, that's really good. So here we have, again, those simple models I talked about and some interaction models here. And you can see that these top three ones are definitely the, the ones to, to look at here. Um, what's cool about this is that all top three of them have something to do with this nest type. Um, and though that these are pretty evenly weighted between them, there's one at 35% and the other two at 27 and 21%, that in all of them, this, this thing is coming up. And this is reflected in the standardized beta estimates, where you get the, the bolded ones in each model are this, uh, this nest type, and especially with the artificial. Although in this third ranking model, you also see the transect popping out again, and road type. And this is also reflected just looking at the raw data, where you see not only do we have more artificial nests to begin with, but there's a greater number of that, uh, a greater percentage of those nests is occupied compared to the natural nests. And that's a significant relationship there. These other two, they're more trends than, they're, they're not significant, but they're trends that have been reflected also in the standardized beta estimates. Um, where you see that the old roads have at least a little bit higher occupancy rates than the forest roads, or the, the forest transects. And in this, we have not only more unpaved road nests, and, but, uh, but we have a greater percentage of that occupied than the other ones. So going back to the research questions, does nest distribution have any particular habitat variables associated with it? And I would say yes. Um, for the models, the, the one that popped out the most was the old road forest model, and in particular with the old roads being important. And for looking at nest occupancy, um, the same sort of thing. Yes, we did see a relationship, and there were strong associations strong associations with the nest type, but also with management and human disturbance a little bit. Um, but the key part of that was access to artificial substrate. So going back to those original hypotheses for those three different things, we did see that wood rats seem to be more active in old roads and with artificial nest substrate. 
but we did not see any relationship with forest age. So, getting into the why. Why, why use old roads? It could be just because that old roads tend to have artificial substrate on them. But that would be the complete story because artificial substrate is not found on all old roads. Um, and it, it can be found in, in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't have to be associated with a road in particular. So as an alter, alternate explanation might be that wood rats are attracted to the edge areas that roads seem to have. Um, there's been a lot of literature, a lot of work done on roads creating edge habitats. Now this could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what, what you are as a species. Um, but they can produce higher habitat heterogeneity and they can have higher vegetation species diversity. And without the, the risk of being hit by a car, it might be even better. However, with the model selection, we didn't see any of those forest structure or forest age variables pop out of us. So if, if there is something going on, we're not seeing it very well in the models. And just from looking at comparing the, the old roads to the forest transects, we did see that the old roads did have shallower soil and a more open understory. But uh, those are just things that I noticed. They weren't really coming up in the models. So, yeah, something to think about anyway. Uh, but why artificial substrate? Uh, it definitely came up a lot in the occupancy models. Very strong thing. Um, but why? It could be because that these structures are easier to maintain. I mean, imagine. You have to collect all these sticks as a wood rat, and not only just collect them and put them in a pile, but to have them support the structure in which you could actually you could make rooms within without collapsing in on itself. Every time a storm comes through, you have to maintain it some more. It's decomposing constantly, so you have to keep replacing sticks. It's a lot of work to keep that up. So if you're living, if you if you're building your nest inside a car. Maybe that cuts out some of that maintenance. You're not getting direct rain if you're in a car. Maybe no, not as much wind damage. Um, the size of the car might provide wall structure, might provide a way of keeping it upright without as many sticks. So it could be just better in that way. Or it could be for protection against predators. Um, we've seen with other wood rats that they can use structures, and they can prefer structures with the ability to repel predators. Um, and maybe these cars and these other artificial substrate nests are essentially doing the same thing. If there's a wall of metal between you and a predator as opposed to a, a bunch of little sticks, maybe that's a benefit. Maybe that's better. Uh, and something that we didn't see that was kind of important was we didn't see any apparent relationship with forest age or forest structure. Um, so getting, getting more into the speculatory part of this, but uh, we have to ask ourselves why is there this lack of consensus in the earlier literature? Um, and it could be a couple things. It could just be difference in methods, or it, might possibly be the changing that wood rats are changing their preferences over time. Which is that that one's kind of way out there, but something to think about. With the methods, um, there are some differences. Some of the earlier authors might have undersampled the younger forests, the more disturbed areas. And that's why we're seeing the earlier literature cite that wood rats are using older forests and medium forests. Um, well, it could just be difference in sampling methods. Uh, they were using live traps, and I was looking at the nests themselves, so it could just be that difference. But uh, with forest age, it's possible that wood rats are actually changing their preferences over time, if, if the literature is tracking the same things that wood rats are tracking. Because you see this interesting pattern where 
it's it's very very linear. It's very structured. Where the earlier authors were pointing out that they seem to like older forests, then we shift into medium, into younger, all the while getting into more and more disturbed areas, and then getting more literature into oh well maybe it's not related to forest at all. Maybe it's related to that nest substrate, which is also supported in my study. So it's possible that wood rats were in in these area in these time periods that wood rats were uh, attracted to old forests for for other reasons, and maybe this availability of artificial substrates made them change the way that they that they view their habitats, maybe change their preferences. But still, kind of speculative. Interesting to think about. Um, but for my study, uh, some conclusions. We did see some links to anthropogenic variables, and especially with artificial substrate, old roads, and to a lesser extent, unpaved roads. Um, some caveats to the study. I was looking at the distribution of occupancy. So it shows us where the wood roads are, but it doesn't necessarily say say that wood rats are being successful in these areas. Um, there's a study by Van Horn in the Journal of Neurology back in the 80s, and she pointed out that just because a species is dense in a particular area doesn't mean it's quality habitat. And that may be the case here. It's just part of the methods. Um, so there is a vague potential that <coughs> The areas that they are attracted to could be ecological traps. Um, they might say, oh, this looks good, but it might be in an area that otherwise doesn't support them very well. Um, so if I were to suggest a next step to this, I would say try to look at the fitness of these wood rats in these different areas. And th that way you would know for sure. But uh, some management implications. Um, just from what I've been looking at, it doesn't seem forest age is a leading factor at present for how wood rats are choosing where to live. Um, old roads do seem to be used more by wood rats, and they do seem to be using artificial substrate more. And this suggests with the, since they are using artificial substrate, it does suggest that they would also use supplemental with us. Um, and that should be looked into more definitely. So with that, I'd like to thank all these lovely people. I couldn't do my work without them. And are there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> so we'll open to the audience and I'll have the committee. So, what are the artificial uh, habitats for nests? Some of them were actually built to attract wood rats. Right. The the things that I the nests that I termed supplemental, those were actually built by volunteers at the Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge for wood rats to use. I might be confusing those categories. So they, they went into your factor for. I, I didn't directly, for the supplemental oh, nest proximity, I pretty much, um, except for the supplemental nest proximity, that was one of the habitat variables. And that's, um, but I left those out of the um, the nest that I counted. It just seems to me if they really like artificial nests, they could throw up all your your biological comparisons. It could, it could mask all of the forest preference, it could, just cause, and they could all be next to roads, because you know, the, uh, if people are making, are you saying you did not include the supplemental nets in your data? I did not. Okay. There's a student at NC State who's looking specifically at the supplemental nets in those patterns, so we can include some outside data. So I'll, I'll just walk that back and I'm going to take up all your time. So you said that there were not all these artificial nets were next to, not all the roads had artificial nets in the trail next to them. That's correct. Uh, some of the roads are. They're, they're unpaved roads, and a lot of them are, it's been a long time since they've been used, so they didn't have any artificial substrate on them at all. 
But those were still more attractive to the blue rats. Yes. Which is very strange. I, I don't know. That's a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just letting uh, my question is, while you're speculating on it, it really is a change in preference from like old forests to now more disturbed forests, mm -hmm. what would be a possible environmental driver that would be leading the climate change there? Um, it could just be more availability of the artificial nest substrate. I mean, if that's more attracted to them, attractive to them, during that time period throughout the 70s, throughout the 80s, there was more of that being dropped in, into these areas. There's like an increase in that amount yeah. of trash. So it's possible it's, it was just that, but it could have been mm -hmm. other other forest structure changes. I, I don't know. So you showed a map of the 77 Key Largo wood rat nests, artificial and natural. Right. And it's kind of interesting. There's a region in the far north uh, east of the island called Dynamite Dock. And even though it has old roads, and, and two of them, two big old roads uh, through that area, there weren't any nests, artificial or otherwise. Why do you think that was? Um, yeah, not, not so much. Uh, but th those main old roads back there are the paved roads, which, as you saw with the occupancy, there were fewer nests along paved roads in general, and more along those unpaved roads. So maybe that was a factor. For some reason, there is some forest years for some road that I clean the old like the remove the artificial the artificial structure, artificial things from there. Then where the rat will go? They will have uh, they will prefer the other habitat then. Well, um, they they would have to yeah they would have to find something else. Um, and historically, they used to build these large um, stick nests that had no. Like they weren't based around a tree root or anything; they'd just be pretty much freestanding stick nests. And we don't—I was surveying all over the place, and I didn't see many of those. And the ones I did see were within a car or under some kind of cover. So, yeah. Then, then eventually they might have to shift back towards something like that, or. It'd be interesting to see what would happen. Sorry, possibly that your findings will encourage the people to throw the car and <laughs> all the refrigerator into the forest so that there will be more people like that. Yeah, it's, it's the strangest thing because. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I was wondering if you noticed within a potential territory, was there a mixture of artificial nests or would it be all natural nests? What's I was from let's see from from what I saw um, there would be plenty of like uh, if you were along an old road there'd be plenty of artificial nests but there would also be naturalness in that same area which uh, indicates that there might be a mix you know. um. I may be interested to the preference of the fruits, like uh, what type of it's the old growth have so many species, yeah. uh, and then the young ones few species. So is there your model didn't say any difference? Right, right. The, the the food it wasn't a, a well performing model, um, but it may just because um, they wood, wood rats are pretty at least the ones on Key Largo are pretty generalist. So and then there most of the the tree species down there, as you know, is it's producing fruit or leaves or something that they could eat year round. So I don't, I don't think that's the limiting factor there. Have you seen the predator distribution of? Uh, Michael Cove, who's working down there, he's extensively looking at where cats are in the landscape, um, and those would be their main predators down there, I think. Um, the next one up, there's there's the, the raccoons and the possums, but I don't think those are predators. They could be competitors, but probably not. And there's like one coyote running around down there, so I don't think he's much of a problem. <laughs> so the thing is, if you see the predators, they, they move around as roads and they destroy as more than the 
that the more growth are more basically more covering like vegetation. So it's kind of counter that. Yeah, so <laughs> but you did a thing it, so you seen characters move along roads more than... Yeah, you see, I saw one day the cat moving around and I put it to them and then uh, there are some... I mean, usually you see those predators uh, there on, along the road and disturb area and inside. Okay. Yeah. But I saw only one cat. So. On the eighth. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions? Where they get their water? From? Uh, yeah, there's no there's no fresh water out there in terms of like standing water, but uh, they generally get their water from their food. Um, they, in desert wood rats, it's sort of the same thing. They're they're getting so the water from the food. Your flesh and food. Right. So did you look at the species composition along nests? Like around the nests. Uh, yeah, for the tree species, yeah. I saw you had a guitar down and that's looks like Yeah, I, I did look at that. Um, I didn't directly compare like particular species with wood rat occupancy or nest distribution, but I, I do have the data, so I could go back and look at that. Um, what about the main one that is developing in the income? Do you look at any relationship on that, or are they are also are they are they are is there any fermentation effect? Like do they stay on one side of the road, or do you think there's somehow sharing? Yeah, both sides. Yeah. Um, uh, a past study by McCleary in two thousand three, and in more recent years in two thousand six when he was publishing, um, they use radio telemetry and they did not find that wood rats were crossing that main road. So, you know, possible impacts of fragmentation from that. Uh, they did find, there was a genetic study, and they found that there were distinct subpopulations on the island. Uh, there were divides because of that road. Uh, but it may become less of a divide if, if the population grows, I, I don't know. Is it receiving more trash now, now that I guess the only road that is still open? Like, is it people throwing more trash around? Or it, or well, the, now it's 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 monitored pretty closely by the, the, the federal and the state um, managers. So it, the, the illegal dumping is definitely not. It, it stopped many, many decades ago. So. Anything else? Well, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you for coming. We're going to open our doors at our lab at 5 o'clock uh, for the barbecue. So come join us. Let's get some snacks. And we'll see you in the mail. Thank you.